Okay, um, start off with this. It's probably a good question to start with. What is the point of coming to a retreat? I have always been a law-abiding citizen and an obedient child. Kindly explain the benefits. <clears throat> well, for me, um, my my way into Buddhism um, began as a teenager when I looked around me and I I just felt everything was very um, fake and empty and pretty well a waste of time. I couldn't see anybody anywhere that I could look up to as a role model and think in 10, 20 years I would like to be like this person. I had no interest in making money, being successful, although I think I probably could have done that if I wanted to. I um, was always top of my class um, from when I was in junior school and uh, academically very successful, but I had no interest in that. The questions that I was interested in asking, um, nobody else seemed interested in at all, and they were, what's a good way to live? What's the best way to live? If you're in this world for 60, 70, 80 years, what, what should you try and do with your life to make it really worthwhile? That was one question, very important. Another one was, why is the world like this? Why is the world such a miserable place? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there so much injustice? Why is there so much hatred, selfishness, greed? Why is it like this? Does it have to be like this? Is there anything that can be done about it? And if there is something that can be done to decrease the amount of suffering in the world and increase the amount of happiness in the world, then what is your responsibility as a human being uh, to try to contribute to that? So uh, most of my friends um, you know, thought I was weird and um, I... Um, I uh, was uh, felt really alienated, and so uh, more or less as soon as I, I could, um, I left England and uh, haven't hardly been back there ever again since I was 17 years old. But um, for myself, I think that just being, you know, a law-abiding citizen and an obedient child is okay. Yeah, it's a good thing. I. But it's a kind of a pretty uh, low standard. Um, it's a pretty kind of narrow idea of, of what it can be to be a human being in this world and what the, the challenges and the opportunities and the, um, and the possibilities of this human birth are. I think it's kind of like dreary kind of attitude. Well, you know, I'm... I'm all right, I, I don't break the laws, you know, I'm, I make some money, I do all right. Um, so my response to that kind of worldview, uh, right or wrong, since I was a teenager is, yeah, so what? Yeah, you make a lot of money, so what? What for? Ultimately, what for? What's the real purpose? So when you die, you've got a million dollars in the bank. So what? what? What's the difference between dying with a million dollars in the bank and dying with ten dollars in the bank? You're going to die anyway. You know, what's it all for? What, what is it that can really give life a sense of meaning and purpose? Um, so my, it was with that kind of questioning that I rejected religious tradition, which I grew up, 
I found Christianity completely unsatisfying um, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually. I started to study uh, philosophy, psychology, um, pretty well neglected all my curriculum. But in those days there was, um, it was a little bit easier for people like me because you didn't have so much testing and uh, I'm very good at cramming. So if I just spent like five or six days before an exam, just uh, really studied hard, I could pass all my exams very well. So I left the rest of the term. I just uh, <coughs> neglect all my studies. Teachers used to get quite upset. And I'd study. I wasn't just hanging out. I was studying, but studying other things that I was really interested in. <coughs> I'm not um, suggesting that you do this, by the way. <laughs> but this was my particular path. Um, so finally I came across the, the teachings of the Buddha and they just made complete sense to me. It just seemed so obvious. Um, not something exotic and Asian, and but just completely obvious that... Um, Human beings have wonderful potential, um, but it's a potential that only can be realized through uh, through study and through um, practice and effort, and that um, following the Buddha's teachings, um, one has an opportunity to abandon um, all the causes of suffering in one's own heart and is able to um, help to reduce the amount of suffering, increase the amount of happiness and, and welfare in the society in which one lives. So this was for me a, like a guiding principle, um, an education, um, not of you know particular academic topic, subject, but an education of my whole life in terms of my conduct, my speech, my emotions, my thoughts, uh, my views, taking on the, the Buddha's teachings as a, an education process um, and finding the, the fulfillment in that but also developing the tools and the understanding by with, with which to help others also. So my um, my initial intention in in going on retreats uh, was to learn some life skills to develop the ability to deal with my own mind. I felt looking at myself and looking at others just how um, weak and uh, indulgent and scattered and trivial my life was and that it didn't have to be that way, it wasn't necessary, it wasn't something imprinted on my genes, um, it's a result of choices that I made moment by moment. So Buddha's, Buddhism is teaching us, giving us the ability to make wiser choices in our life. I think many of you, um, or I hope some of you will be familiar with a famous um, psychology experiments um, performed in New York in the early 60s. They had a huge um, huge repercussions, huge impact on <coughs> uh, on academic and, and wider circles. In these um, experiments, um, volunteers were requested, and I think they were actually paid to participate in these psychology experiments. If you were one of these people who volunteered, you'd go into um, a large room and with everybody in the room looking very scientific with white coats and and um, various sort of scientific paraphernalia 
and then you'd be told that you were going to participate in an experiment to gauge the correlation between learning and punishment. And you'd be shown a rather fat man sitting on a chair uh, in a glass case, glass room, um, which was hooked up to um, um, an electrical system. Outside there were a number of buttons going from 10 volts way up to 200, 300 volts, which is potentially life-threatening. You'd be told that um, you ask this person these questions and if they cannot answer, you give them an electric shock to see whether that will make them um, answer any more quickly, try harder. Now if you give a 10 volt shock and he can't answer, then the next time you give a 20 volt and you can just keep going up the scale. And, uh, oh yes, one other thing that you'd be told is that this person um, has a heart disease, has heart disease, so uh, giving him an electric shock might be a little bit dangerous. So you start to answer this guy these questions and he starts to uh, sweat and get and look uncomfortable. He can't think of the answers. He starts to panic. You give him a 10 volt shock. It makes it worse. You give him 20 um, and he can't answer. He's really losing it. And you start to go up the scale and he's starting to scream a little bit. Now, this uh, experiment with variations was carried on um, on a number of many days and in fact it was a setup as most of these really good psychology experiments are that the man in the chair was an actor and it wasn't really hooked up to the electrical system Um, it wasn't an electric chair he wasn't really being shocked the experiment wasn't really to see the connection or the correlation between punishment and learning what it was interested in seeing was whether ordinary people off the street, law-abiding citizens, would be under certain circumstances willing um, to give potentially life-threatening electric shocks to another human being if they believed that they wouldn't have to take any responsibility for it. And in fact, um, many people, when the man started to scream, They would turn to the scientists there and they say, is this all right? He looks like he's in pain. They said, yes, yes, we'll take responsibility. It's just part of the experiment. Don't worry about it. And it turns out that um, I think 70 or 80% of the people um, went right up to the highest level of electric shock, like two, 300 volts, which is really incredibly painful if it was real. Now, this, these experiments were in the, you know, still in the aftermath of the Second World War. And it was a huge question, um, and one that's never really been resolved. Is Germany was, in many ways, the, the leader of European culture um, in the mid-20th century, with the greatest philosophers, the greatest composers, um, greatest writers, you know, um, scientists, all coming from, from Germany, or so many of them coming from Germany. And yet this country, which was the leader of Western culture, could, within a few years, um, become a Nazi culture, one in which, for instance, six million Jewish people were killed horribly and in which uh, it waged war on many countries and were incredibly cruel, and so on. And so how do you explain that? And if you put forward the argument that it was just a small number of psychopaths or monsters, it doesn't really explain um, how this whole system was able to sustain itself for so long. And what you find is that many of the people who did the worst and cruelest and terrible things 
were before the Second World War began just ordinary law-abiding citizens. And if um, the society hadn't changed in that way, they may have lived their life that way. The point being that morality, um, kindness, uh, compassion, honesty, um, so many of these qualities, unless they've been systematically developed, tend to be extremely superficial um, and can disappear overnight. You can, um, many people, the majority of people, can be rather kind and uh, uh, and unselfish, but because surrounding situa- the situation and conditions allow them to be that way or um, encourage them to be that way, but because they've never consciously developed those qualities in their mind. It's just like automatic, unthinking, sort of sleepwalking uh, kind of virtues. That suddenly things change and you're put on the spot. Um, And it's more difficult to be virtuous than it is to be unvirtuous. It's easier to be cruel than it's to be kind. Many people just become cruel because it's easier because they've always followed the easy way. So this is the danger. When everything comes very easily, you just take the easy path again and again and again, and and then that becomes who you are, the person who takes whatever is the easiest path. So if you're fortunate enough to live in a society or in a family um, where the choices you're encouraged to make are good ones, then maybe you get away with it. But if suddenly things change, and you're in a situation where it's easier uh, to be dishonest and cruel and selfish, then you'll probably be that way because you don't have any core to your being. Uh, you just follow um, whatever is given. And so that very kind of conditioned, superficial, sleepwalking kind of existence is is normal and completely natural. Um, and it's in, in fact in many ways... Um, encouraged in the um, in the society in which we live. So for me, um, Buddhist practice and, and coming on a retreat is part of this, um, means taking an interest in um, self-development, developing a real core of meaning and purpose in your life, taking responsibility uh, for your life, not just sort of floating along and, and just... Um, Uh, following the party line, whatever it may be, but really finding out for yourself what life's all about about, and finding a way towards some sense of real inner value and worth. So to do that you need um, certain mental strength, integrity, self-discipline, um, these kinds of qualities may not be very popular these days and not very um, many people aspire to them, but it's a timeless truth that without them you can't really achieve anything uh, very much. Um, and you know, to, to to think, you know, you want to uh, achieve something. I mean, you know, to be um, a little bit direct. I mean, how many of you could stop talking yesterday? How many of you even tried? You know, um, there there again is this. It, it, this is where you can really see. I mean, you can. What happens is we follow our desires, but we follow the, what's easy, and then probably you come up with some kind of um, reason for it afterwards to explain it, so you feel a little bit better about yourself when you uh, when you're unable to keep to a particular standard or promise. So, in, in fact, modern education system is one which is often giving you uh, more and more sophisticated excuses. Uh, for following your desires uh, rather than making you more rational. It means that you have uh, very much more um, skillful at creating rational uh, rationalizations for conduct rather than being more rational. Um, So to put it on a um, slightly more positive note, there's a huge amount of research these days um, basically um, made possible through latest technologies such as MRI um, machines 
to establish the, the value of developing mindfulness and the um, so the, the the results that are out there now in the scientific community which are undisputed um, are for instance the effects on um, the immune system uh, people who meditate a lot tend to have a much more robust immune system uh, which means they're much more much less likely um, to uh, develop physical illness um, they um, are able to handle stress uh, much better um, there there are um, changes in brain function and brain structure um, as a result of a um, uh, a sustained meditation practice these days they talk of certain um, if, if the, the brain is often divided into three levels or three parts so you have what's called the reptile brain the mammalian brain and the sort of the higher cortex so this idea that the evolution of mankind you start off with this reptile brain which is basically you know um, a fight or flight um, so like strong emotions for to um, for procreation or for survival and then we develop the emotional brain the the mammalian brain and then the last sort of the truly human brain the rational faculties and so on are in the, the cortex of the the last um, development of the brain so sometimes these um, these different parts of the brain don't work in harmony very well. We we have like caveman emotions in uh, modern sophisticated environments, um, and um, and they um, bypass or hijack the uh, more rational, um, quite kinds of thought. For instance, let's say. Um, <clears throat> you see something in the distance now you it's not clear enough for you to see exactly what it is but uh, your reptile brain um, kicks in first and if it sees that it might possibly be something dangerous then it will send all these signals to your body you know all this adrenaline and and you're ready to fight or you're ready to run away and then it's only some fractions of a second later that the the perception of what that thing is appears. <coughs> so um, your reptile brain might have said, "Looks like it could be a snake," and so you have a sort of all these uh, anti-snake uh, um, uh, snake protection chemicals running through you, you know, ready. But then a fraction of a second later. You see, it's a piece of rope. But then you, you, all these emotions come up, all these chemicals are running through your body um, because, because you're afraid of a snake before you even see the snake. It's a safety first um, kind of um, system. And it, this is also an explanation of why is it that... that uh, we're always more interested in bad news than good news or why is it that newspapers are always full of bad news rather than good news it's part of the way our brains are um, because if, uh, if something is bad news in your immediate environment and you miss it you might get eaten or killed but if something is good news like you know there's uh, there's some fruit trees a couple of kilometer walk up there or there's an animal you can hunt over there if you miss out on the good news you're, it's not going to have an immediate um, uh, serious impact so um, bad things have always been more important to the brain than good things because if you if you're heedless about a bad thing you might die if you're heedless about a good thing you won't so this is uh, some way the, the brain works so um, what I wanted to say was that in this frontal cortex, which has what's nowadays called executive functions, which means the higher functions of, of thinking, analysis, creativity, um, decision making, in fact, all these, all these um, functions are nowadays grouped under a term called executive functions. Now, 
they measured the um, the part of the brain which is associated with these executive functions, and um, it starts to shrivel, uh, you know, after a certain age. Um, but if you if you look at the brain of a 60-year-old meditator, somebody who's been meditating most of their life, um, they have um, the same kind of um, integrity of this area of the brain as someone 10 or 15 years younger than them. So the, there are these kinds of um, uh, studies coming out now which saying that a, a regular meditation practice doesn't just affect the way your brain works moment by moment, but affects actual structural changes, prevents the deterioration of certain parts of the brain. Um, <clears throat> and unless you have a strong hereditary um, or genetic um, likelihood of getting Alzheimer's, someone who meditates regularly is very unlikely to develop that kind of illness. Um, the restraint and the ability to delay gratification, um, the ability to um, control negative emotions, to deal with negative emotions effectively, to promote positive emotions, to experience inner happiness. Um, these are all the kinds of benefits of meditation practice so it seems to me that if you you know if you can embark upon a particular kind of education um, which is good for you physically um, meaning that you're less likely to get physically ill you get better more quickly when you are ill you're able to deal with physical pain um, much more skillfully one in which you're developing skillful means to deal with negative emotions and to promote positive emotions when you're creating the conditions for the uh, efficient working of the higher mental faculties like critical and creative thinking then I think uh, meditation is well worth the effort Okay, because there's only one question, I answer, give a long answer to that one. But is there anything, uh, any more questions, or anybody would like to just ask something or re respond to what I've just said? Anybody's? Yeah, I um, have to kind of deconstruct that question a little bit. Um, there is, because the, the words that we use in, in English are, you know, are so imprecise. You know, English is a really good language for like technical subject. But when you start talking about the human mind, it's very imprecise um, and it's very open to, to confusion. So there's, there's one level of... Uh, of pleasure. Let, let's maybe use the word pleasure rather than happiness. So, um, in fact, what the Buddha is saying is that the, um, the suffering is, on this level, suffering is the other word, it's very imprecise, um, is more fundamental than pleasure. The, the pleasure tends to be a reduction in the intensity of suffering. So, for instance, you, you know, you're really hot and, and really bothered and you come into a cool place and you feel really pleasurable because you've reduced the amount of, of suffering. Um, and many, uh, many experiences of everyday pleasure are merely that. Or when you get something that you really, really want, um, it's questionable how much of the pleasure is, is in the consumption or the experience of that particular object and how much it is just taking away all the stress and the tension and the desire of wanting to get it, afraid that you're not going to get it. And the fact that um, 
this kind of pleasure doesn't tend to last very long um, because it's conditioned by all kinds of things that you can't control. Um, for instance, your own physical body, and you can only sus- physically, physiologically, you can only sustain a certain level of happiness for um, a pleasure, physical pleasure, for a certain length of time. Then you uh, you get hungry, you're tired, you need to go to the toilet or whatever. Um, now, another part of this is that this uh, this kind of pleasure often leads to more suffering in the future uh, when you start to derive less and less pleasure from the same stimulation. Um, so you see this with drugs. You know, you take one pill and you get a certain kind of high and then after a while you need to take two to get the same kind of high and you have to take three and then you know, you're on the path of, of addiction because you have to increase the stimulation. So this is the law of diminishing returns. Um, so this is, this is the whole um, sort of play of pleasure and pain in everyday life. Okay? But in, in Buddhism, when we're talking about like, happiness and suffering, we're, we're, we're not always talking about that level of pain and pleasure. And it's important to, to recognize or understand that Buddhism is not teaching like an emotionless kind of state where you just don't feel anything that that's um, like a goal to, uh, to aspire to. But um, what we can um, observe is that certain emotions are stimulated and fed by ignorance and craving, and certain emotions are not. And so through the path of, of meditation and practice, as you reduce the power of these negative thoughts um, and cravings, then the emotions associated with them become become less. But those emotions which are not created or fed by negative emotions or ignorance um, actually become stronger. So one of the key um, uh, things to observe is how intimately connected wisdom and compassion are. And, and the Buddha, when he was enlightened, um, became someone who, who was... Um, his, his Buddhahood was most clearly defined in terms of his wisdom and his compassion. So those are the two so main powers or, or virtues of the Buddha. So these kind of positive emotions of kindness and compassion, empathy all these become released and become much more powerful um, to the extent that you can let go of the negative emotions. But it's, <clears throat> so it's an emotional development, it's an abandonment of negative emotion and development of positive emotion. But even with the positive emotion, if you identify with the emotion, say that's who I really am, then you, you're liable to, to suffer through that um, force of identification. So there's, there's pain and pleasure alternating in, in daily life, something to study and understand the whole dynamic of. And then there's a much larger question of what is happiness, uh, what is suffering. And, and there are very many different and increasingly subtle um, levels of this. And um, if we're, I, I think one analogy and comparison is of health. You know, if we you say someone, I'm in really good health, and then you would say, someone was to ask you, well, what does that mean? What do you mean, in really good health? It's very hard to answer that question in a positive idiom. You have to usually say, well, I don't have any aches and pains, or I don't have this, or I don't have that. So, and then somebody said, well, that sounds a pretty kind of negative thing, you know, just all the things you don't have. But, I mean, what's health really like? But it's so difficult to express that verbally. And, and the kind of happiness that develops through Dhamma practice is like that. You know, it, it's hard to really say, you know, it's not like a, a high in that kind of, you know, there's kind of high you can get from some kind of stimulation. But it's that sense of health, like mental health, you know, where you don't have this depression or anxieties and worries and, and, and uh, agitation and all those um, unhealthy mental traits um, are no longer present or only 
uh, very um, fleetingly present. Anybody over here? No question? So I'm going to ask the... Now these are in Thai. Ah, English one. The Thai ones this afternoon. Yeah. at all. I quite um, sympathize. Um, I think it's very important to stress that like meditation is not some kind of magic bullet or it's not uh, a panacea. I mean it's not like you can cure every kind of mental problem um, through some meditation technique. Um, particularly if you take that technique out of the context of the whole of the Buddha's teachings or the whole, they call the whole educational process and this is what often happens particularly as I've seen in the West where people take Buddhist meditation techniques but um, completely out of the whole context of the Buddhist training of sila and samadhi and banya but um, in many in, to begin with prevention is better than cure but in the case that someone has uh, quite a chronic um, illness like this um, then drugs you know, can, can play an important part at least um, short term just to give somebody the ability just to rest and to make, so make a fresh start so I think that um, in, in some cases there, you know, there needs to be both um, both things and placebo effect is of course um, very powerful and in the anti-depression medications the, the um, uh, what do they call I um, can't remember I can't remember all the names of the anti-depression medicines but anyway um, if you give somebody a um, a pill and just tell them and it's an antidepressant and then gives them a real antidepressant, there's hardly any difference in the results that you'll get. So when somebody believes that they're taking an antidepressant, then they'll get the same results if it's, as actually taking one. So you, you, we do have these um, inner resources if we know how to, um, to make use of them. I, uh, yesterday, the point I was trying to make was that just generally... Um, the moment, if it's not a sort of a serious illness, one in which you need to see a psychiatrist or a therapist, um, but one which um, you're just leading a pretty um, scattered and unbalanced, um, crazy kind of lifestyle, and you just want some kind of medication to be able to keep up that crazy lifestyle, instead of saying, maybe I need to change the way I'm living my life, um, then that's, that's what I was criticizing. Um, but I, I fully recognize that there are um, some drugs that are necessary and useful uh, for mental suffering. 
Atlantida War Civilization I'm afraid I don't understand the question. The um, Atlantida War Civilization, something 72 or 73, it was clean, parenthesis, complete civilization, now civilization N84 mixed combined, devil stealthily yeah I don't um, maybe if you could rephrase that in Thai or I, I, I don't really know what the question means um, something about God and the devil anyway does anybody w- want to ask or if you're embarrassed maybe just to rephrase the question Um, please explain the difference between sin in Christianity and Bāp in Buddhism. Yeah, this very um, significant difference. Um, some many years ago now, there was a request from Buddhist community in Thailand to the um, Catholic community. Please don't use Buddhist technical terms to translate Christian terms because it's confusing Um, but they um, didn't agree and so often sin uh, in in Christianity in in the Thai Bible I think is translated as Baap but it's important to to recognize there's very um, significant differences between the two concepts so in, in Christianity you have the idea of a God who lays down rules. Um, humanity um, should learn these rules and keep them. And if, uh, if you're disobedient, then God will punish you. And if you're obedient... God will reward you. So it's a reward and punishment system. You need to know what God wants you to do and try to do it. Um, in, in Buddhism, um, we, we do not believe in a creator God. We don't believe in someone who's laid down rules for human beings and rewards them when they do good things and punishes them when they do bad things. Um, The Buddha's starting point uh, for the Dhamma, or the Buddha Dhamma, is human nature. And what we can observe about human nature and what we can do, what we can, uh, the wisest way to deal with our human nature The Buddha said, um, pointed out that if we act or speak or think about things, um, when our mind is affected or um, influenced uh, by defilement, by greed, by hatred, by delusion, then... um, we, our mind becomes more greedy, uh, more hateful, more deluded. So every time you act with greed, you increase the amount of greed in your mind. Every time you act with anger, you increase the amount of anger in your mind. Every time you act, you think, you dwell upon something with jealousy, you increase the power of jealousy in your mind. Those, those negative qualities um, we can call bad karma um, and they are going to increase um, suffering in your life, in present and in future. 
So, um, whenever we act with greed, hatred, and delusion, then that's bāp. So the definition of bāp is dependent upon the particular mental phenomena present in the mind, moment by moment. It's not a matter of um, obeying or disobeying rules um, that are found in a book somewhere or in a holy book. Um, It's a matter of the um, psychological factors, emotions present in the mind and identified with moment by moment. So I think it's very clear there's a significant difference there. Uh, The second question is the difference between Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana. Um, Well, this this is kind of a huge um, topic and one which you could write um, PhD thesis or thick books about. Um, So I'll make just a few very simple uh, comments or generalizations. After um, the Buddha passed away, Buddhist communities, monastic communities spread throughout India. In those days, of course, communications were poor. And so the particular um, slant or interpretation of the teachings or those areas of the teachings which were emphasized would depend a lot on the monks in that particular group and in particular on the personality of and wisdom of the teacher. So inevitably, you know, there were certain differences that arose. And um, the Buddhists um, also were living in a very, probably the most sophisticated um, culture in the history of the world. I mean, religiously, there's never before or after, even to the present day, um, a society so um, sophisticated in religious and spiritual matters as the India of 2,500 years ago. And so Buddhists were constantly being asked, you know, well, Buddha teaches this, how does that differ from what my religion teaches? Or this kind of question about sin and, and bāp and all these kinds of things. And so there was um, pressure on, on the monks to systematize the teachings of the Buddha. And this is the background to what we call the Abhidhamma, the, the effort um, to put all the Buddha's teachings into a, like a, a system. And so various of these different groups of um, monastic groups, can't really call them sects, but probably could, that's the word that's usually used, um, developed their own um, systematization, their own Abhidhamma. So what we have was usually called the uh, Tripitok. You know, we have the, the suttas, which are the discourses of the Buddha, the Vinaya, which are all the rules governing the life of the monks. And then we have Abhidhamma. But there's not just one Abhidhamma. There are lots of Abhidhammas uh, according to the different sects and their um, scholars um, systematizing the teachings. So we have a Theravada Abhidhamma and there were various other Abhidhammas. So th- this was a cause for some divergence. And the after a while... You could see that the groups amongst developed into two main kind of groups, which we could very simply refer to as the conservatives and the liberals. Okay, so the conservative groups all had the basic idea that the teachings that the historical Buddha um, laid down are complete, and there's everything there that human beings need to study and practice and realize enlightenment. And it is the, the job um, of uh, monks and those Buddhists to, um, to transmit those teachings, to look after them, to keep studying and practicing them, um, and to share them with anyone who might be interested. 
So that's the, the conservative group. And there were many of these sects, um, and most of the, all of them uh, gradually disappeared. And the one that survived was called Theravada, what we now call Theravada. It spread to the south of India and then moved over to Sri Lanka, where it flourished. Now, of the other, <clears throat> the other um, sects, it was called liberal, um, were, um, had many um, new ideas about the Buddha, who the Buddha was, uh, what enlightenment is, um, and they were also much more willing to adapt to surrounding value systems and religions. Their idea was that you, you maintain the essence, but you should be willing to be more um, flexible with cultural, external, or superficial elements of the teachings in order to spread the teachings as widely as you can. So this was a much more kind of missionary, um, expansive kind of Buddhism, which spread throughout India and also northwards into China and eventually from China to Tibet and Korea, Japan, all those countries in northern Asia. So this Mahayana Theravada division is sometimes called uh, Northern Buddhism and Southern Buddhism although for a long time it was Mahayana and Hinayana, but Hinayana was considered to be quite an insulting term, so it was agreed um, quite recently to, to, to use Theravada in, in preference to that. Um, just as a digression here, um, monks um, of the <coughs> um, Theravada school, um, it seems spread also in various places and one group ended up in Egypt and um, may well have formed the um, role model for the Christian monastic system that grew up in the desert of Egypt and Middle East uh, but also the word terra um, is believed to be the root for the modern word therapy uh, therapeutic so something that cures and heals the human mind um, there, there is a belief that it comes from the word um, terra and it originates with this group of monks living in Egypt but there's, there's a kind of a paper on this whether or not it's correct or not is an interesting point Mahayana Buddhism uh, with its very liberal kind of um, stance um, absorbed elements of the uh, cultures and religions that it met as it expanded. Where um, it went to Tibet, for instance, Tibet had a very powerful animist culture called Bun. And so the Tibetan Buddhism absorbed a lot of like animist and magical practices. Uh, it went to China, of course it met Confucianism, Taoism, and absorbed them into itself. It went to Japan and absorbed Japanese cultural elements and religious elements. Um, again, it's, it's um, the, in the Mahayana school itself, and eventually you have Tantrayana, then there are different kinds of philosophies and, and teachings. Um, one, one reason is that they started to write their own suttas uh, which were ascribed to the Buddha. So instead of saying this is you know, the teaching of our wise monks or our teacher, they said it, this is, the Buddha said this and the Buddha said that. So they, weren't, they were criticized for this. They said, How can you put these words into the Buddha's mouth? So the, um, the answer to this was that at the time of the Buddha, um, people weren't very intelligent and the really um, highest teachings were just too hard for people of that time to understand. So the Buddha gave them to the Devas, to the Tevada, and said, look after these teachings until some really smart people are born. Um, and then you can um, transmit Thai taught to these smart monks 
you know, as opposed to the dumb monks in the Buddhist time. And so they said, this is what happened. We, um, so we got these teachings from the devas, but the devas got them from the Buddha. Um, and that's why they're every bit as authentic as the Pali Sutta. So you have all these suttas that are, you know, were various schools of Mahayana Buddhism um, created and that they consider to be as authentic as, or as um, weighty as uh, Theravada. So, uh, trying to be very, to simplify here, the idea of a Buddha is different in, in Mahayana, particularly in Tantrayana. And uh, in Mahayana, this idea of you practice in order to become a Buddha, and that anybody can be a Buddha, and that an arahant is not the end of the practice. There's something beyond arahantship, which um, the Mahayana school um, aspire to. But the, probably the most um, well-known of the Mahayana doctrines is that of the Bodhisattva, and the idea that you renounce uh, your own enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. This is because of a very noble aspiration and one which is characteristic of Mahayana. But um, although there are significant philosoph- philosophical differences, um, it's important to recognize that there's never been any religious wars between Mahayana and Theravada there's never been any open conflict. Um, at most, maybe the Theravadas think we're right and they're wrong, and they think that they're right and Theravadans are wrong. But um, there are some important underlying similarities and, and points of um, communion. One is that the Four Noble Truths is basically accepted by all forms of Buddhism. They say there is suffering, Uh, There is a cause of suffering, there is an end of suffering, and there is a path to the end of suffering. So um, what the, uh, so the first two of those noble truths are explained almost identically. Um, The difference is in the understanding of the third noble truth, what is the complete release from suffering, and uh, most obviously in the fourth noble truth, the path or the particular practices that lead to freedom from suffering. But the, the overall framework of the Four Noble Truths is common to both Theravada and Mahayana. Well, we, we've run over time a little bit, um, so I think we'll leave the morning session um, at this point. And um, please try to be mindful and aware um, and composed and during the midday try to refrain from the speaking addiction as much as you can it's a good training and uh, we'll carry on this afternoon <laughs>